Hello, I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and thank you for joining me. I am in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. We're looking at how God has made provision to deal with the sin nature. We're looking specifically at the ministry of the Spirit in this, and why the Spirit can produce life in us, and why the flesh is not a help, why it's actually uh, it's not something that I can rely on. But there is going to be a positive note that God, that Paul will eventually bring out. We're not going to get to that today. I want to take a little bit of an aside here on a statement that Paul makes in verse 9 uh, and talk about the fact that he says, if indeed the Spirit of, of God lives, and that word over here in the Greek, oike, excuse me, oikai, uh, from the verb oikeo, to dwell or to like live in a house, so he set up a home in you, the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have, does not have, ekai, the Spirit of Christ, this person does not belong to him, or he's not his. And there are perhaps some of you that do not know that when you believed in Jesus Christ, when you believed the gospel, that he died for your sins on the cross, that he was buried and rose again so that you would be, have forgiveness by believing in him, that when, that when you did that, you received the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. You don't have to wait for him. You don't have to have somebody come and lay hands. You receive him. And we have a number of passages that indicate this, but I want to start in John chapter 14. Now, John 14 is before, and I think this is important for us to grasp, um, John 14 is before the Holy Spirit is in believers. In the Old Testament, he wasn't in. He came upon some people, but he didn't indwell people, and he didn't normally indwell most believers. And so Jesus is speaking to his disciples the, the night before he's, he will be betrayed this night. Uh, he will be crucified the next morning, just to put this in perspective. And so he's talking to them about something that he's never spoken to them about. He, he does that all through John chapters 13 through 17. There are all things that he has not talked about any other time during his earthly ministry, because he's looking to some things that are going to start after he rises and, and returns to heaven. So verse 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give to you another counselor or helper that will be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is not able to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. They can't fasten their eyes on him and examine and think about it, is the idea there of that sea. And they don't have any experiential knowledge of him. But he says, But you know him because he remains with you. And this word with in the Greek is this is, uh, it's just a shortened version of the preposition para here, meaning he's alongside you. And I believe he's referring to the fact that when Christ's earthly ministry started, the Holy Spirit came down and anointed or came upon God the Son. And in doing that, then, as the Holy Spirit came down upon him, uh, in that context, that the Spirit then was always on Christ and he was with with the disciples in the sense that he was alongside them during all of this time. And so, but then he goes on, and he will be in you. Will be in you. He's not in you now, disciples. And he's only speaking to the 11. Judas is gone. So he's only speaking to the 11 who are believers. But he says, he will be in you. So that's a, it's a promise of something that is to come. It was going to happen a little while. And We've looked at this verse before. This is, if you can have a favorite verse, this is one of my many favorite verses throughout the New Testament. But he says, in that day, and I believe that in that day, if you just read these, the context here, is the day in which the Spirit is going to come and be in them. And in that day, you will know, you will know in the realm of your experience that I, I am in my Father. You are in me. This is, many of our studies over the last few months have been about us being in Christ up there in Him. And I am in you. The little symbol that we have there on, on the YouTube page is an arrow going up and an arrow going down and a man down here and then a key representative for Christ up there. And we are in Christ and Christ is in us, which is what he says. You are in me and I am in you. In other words, when the Spirit was going to come and set up residence in us, he was also going to join Christ to us. But the Holy Spirit is going to be in us is the main thing. 
Now, there's a statement. This is one of the verses I did grow up learning when I was a little bit older as a child. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. And by the way, let's just read the verse and then we'll comment on it. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Now, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Good English, but the Greek is very interesting because it says, it says uh, the, the body, yours, temple of the, here's Holy Spirit, but of the in you Holy Spirit is sandwiches, which Greek does this frequently, but sandwiches this expression in you between the definite article the and Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, trying to just really make you know, this is a spirit that dwells in you. Now, to put this in the context of just how shocking this statement is, he's writing to believers in Corinth and specifically to men who had been visiting prostitutes. Yeah, plain and simple. Just read the context. He says, avoid that. Run from that. Flee from that. Don't, don't do that. But he says, why would you join your physical body to somebody like that? Because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So why would you misuse it in this way? He doesn't say, hey, quit doing that or you're going to lose the Spirit. He never says that. He says, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that is in you. So quit doing that thing. That's what he actually tells them to do. Kind of a shocking statement uh, for a lot of us as Christians to think. Doesn't in any way make it okay. In fact, the very thing Paul's saying is quit it. Stop it. It's not good. Doesn't make any sense for you to be doing this. Now, I want to also go over to Jude because he makes one other statement about the Spirit with regard to people. In Jude, he's talking about some false teachers who have come in. They're not believers. They are twisting or perverting the grace of God into sexually lewd conduct. In other words, they're saying, oh, we'll show you what real grace is. Real grace means that we can do anything and it's okay. And sometimes when we're immature... We don't really understand or appreciate the grace of God. We can twist the grace of God and make it a license for doing things that are not okay. And we use it as though, oh, it's okay. It's, it's all grace. It's all good. And it's not. And I can testify, part of my Christian life, when I had a very, very long time ago, very naive view of grace, I pushed, I pushed the limits on grace at times, saying, oh, this is okay. I remember trying to talk a friend into participating in some activity. And he goes, I don't know if we should do this. you know. And if I told you what it is, you'd laugh at it because you'd think it was so, so silly that he was worked up about it. But it was a big deal to him at the time. And I tried to say, hey, we're not under law. We're under grace. And that's, by the way, that's abusing grace to try to twist somebody into doing something that, that way. That was wrong. But having said that, these teachers were really pressing that on these unbelie on these believers in this in this these churches, and so these people he says create divisions, and I believe part of that is in order to get people to follow them and, and adopt their view, they've got to separate out the immature believers that are susceptible to listening to their teaching from the strong believers that are going to say, hey, people, this is not God's grace. What does God's grace do? It's liberated us. It's not making you're you're putting yourself a slave. This is what we've been seeing in. Our studies here in Romans, especially back in chapter 6. Furthermore, they're in the HCSB has unbelievers. It's not on unbelievers. It's literally it's soulish. It's the only thing they can operate in. And, and Paul frequently uses the term soulish. In fact, he never uses the word soulish of believers ever. He only uses it of, of believers, that they're soulish. They operate in their soul. And then he goes, not having the Spirit. See, they're soulish. So their only option is to operate in their soul because they don't have the Spirit. But you and I have the Spirit. And this is what Paul is saying over here in Romans 8, 9. Hey, you have the Spirit. If indeed you have the Spirit. And he, he, he's not, we've already talked about this, he's not bringing, calling it into question with the if. The if is to draw them in. If indeed you have the Spirit, pause. And the audience goes, oh yeah, we have the Spirit. Okay, now let's think about that. So, he uses these if these ifs. I think I've explained this before, but this is a construction in the Greek where the if assumes something is true, but it still asks as an if 
to draw the audience into it, expecting the audience really to go, yes, this is the case. Okay, so it is. It's a. It's an if, but it's not an if where Paul's questioning it. There's another way in Greek for Paul to say, if this is true, and maybe it is, maybe it's not. That's not this kind of an if here. And he says, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, this is not his. Just to remind them, to lay it nail home, you guys all have him. Yeah, we're Christ. Okay, well then you have the Spirit. Come on, you, you people know this. Maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe you needed to learn this. Maybe you needed to be reminded that God the Holy Spirit is in you. He's the person, by the way, that is actually going to give you victory or freedom at a moment in time. And he's going to do so in connection with the fact that at the same time that he indwells you, Christ also indwells you. And he's, we're going to see this put together. Hopefully we'll be able to look at that tomorrow. Thank you for joining me today. Some good things to think about. Be encouraged again by the fact that the Holy Spirit is in us. We're not going to lose him. He's with us into the age. Keep that in mind and have a good day in the Lord.